EU and the United States, Strategic Partnership, Trade, Energy, and Security. And this is an important topic for us here at the American Security Project. We were founded in 2005 by some folks you probably know, Kerry and Hagel, Park and Rudman. And they had strong feelings about a number of topical issues, climate change, energy security, nuclear security, asymmetric operations, terrorism, and the economy, just to mention a few, particularly the national security slant on those issues. And what they thought was perhaps they could take all of those issues out of the political realm and talk about it from a national security perspective. So they put a board together, an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, some businessmen and women, but included eight flag officers, three and four star, two from each service, who could talk the national security implications of each one of those issues. And since we've always carried on all those particular issues, these days we're particularly hot on the number one on the economic front. I know perhaps foremost in my mind, and I know on the panel's mind for sure, is TTIP. And if you saw a bit of an announcement this morning that the EU is going to support Turkey's uh, hopefully admission into TTIP as well. So. We are big proponents on TTIP as we are on TPP, and I'm sure some of the speakers will address that specific issue. So with that, I'm going to introduce the panel, just a, a short caveat here. Julieta has to leave shortly after her remarks, so she's going to give her remarks first and then have a, perhaps a short Q&A, and she'll depart, and we'll keep the rest of the, rest of the panel. Uh, so let me introduce them very quickly. Julieta Valsnoyes, I pronounced that correctly is the Deputy Assistant Secretary, Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, and a Career Foreign Service Officer. We get to thank you for your service, and thank you for being here today. Joining her is Paul Adamson, and Paul is the Editor-in-Chief of E-Sharp and Chairman of Foreign Global, and I think you'll tell by his accent where he's from. The, uh, but Paul, welcome to the panel. And last but certainly not least, Simon Rosenberg is the President and Founder of NDN, and he's an experienced television news producer and reporter, so all we'll welcome you here. And last but not least is my chief operating officer, Paul Hamill, and you'll tell by his accent where he's from, and he's going to chair the whole session. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Julia. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, and, and thanks to the American Security Project for hosting us here today. At the State Department, we see the American Security Project as a go-to think tank for creative thinking on how foreign policy should be conducted in the 21st century. We have, of course, coached a few ASP alums along the way. Our uh, Deputy Secretary of State, Heather Higginbottom, was ASP's founder, one of ASP's founders, and first executive director. And uh, former Senator Gary Hart, the ASP chairman, has now returned to service to play a direct role in encouraging the peace process in Northern Ireland. So we feel some affinity here with folks at ASP. I'm delighted to speak today about US-EU cooperation at a time when our partnership is more important than ever for our joint security, our shared prosperity, and our common values. Think about it. Just yesterday, countries across Europe commemorated the moment when, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, guns fell silent on the Western Front ending World War I. Today, most of the countries involved in that conflict are EU member states. And they are fighting together to preserve the self-determination that was so hotly contested during that war. Moreover, they're carrying out their campaigns in words and policies and economic actions rather than in fighting over territory on battlefields. On this 100th anniversary, of the outbreak of the First World War, therefore, it's important to remember that the EU and our transatlantic partnership more broadly was first and foremost a peace project. And what a project it's been. Just look at what we've accomplished together. 25 years ago, also this week, in 1989, Germans tore down the Berlin Wall, and with it, a system that had for decades divided Berlin, Germany, in Europe and the world. Americans stood shoulder to shoulder with our allies in Germany and Europe as they achieved the dream of a Germany reunited and a Europe reborn. Our cooperation with the EU, just like our partnership with individual member states at NATO and in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, is built on these principles. That the path to peace and prosperity is clearest we work and lead together. 
As President Obama said in Tallinn on September 3rd, because of the work of generations, because we've stood together in a great alliance, because people across this continent have forged a European Union dedicated to cooperation and peace, we have made historic progress towards the vision we share, a Europe that is whole and free and at peace. Today, of course, in the wake of Russian aggression in Ukraine, ISIL's terror in Iraq and Syria, and the scourge of Ebola, our partnership is being tested. Meanwhile, we have new leadership in the European Commission, a new European Parliament, and in January we will have a new U.S. Congress coming into office. So it's a good time to examine what the future holds for U.S.-EU relations and cooperation in important areas like security, energy, and trade. I'd like to address each of these in turn. First, on security. The United States and the EU are working together to support Ukraine in the face of the Russian aggression. We welcomed the September 16th passage of the Association Agreement and the Deep Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement in both the RADA and the European Parliament. After all, it was the promise of closer ties with the EU that drove millions of ordinary Ukrainians into the winter streets of Kyiv and elsewhere last year. We have worked closely together to preserve that promise, providing financial assistance to the Ukrainian government for basic public services, advancing reforms in the energy sector, supporting border guards and the military, promoting measures to fight corruption, and helping to ensure free and fair presidential elections and parliamentary elections. And the United States and the EU have worked in lockstep to impose successive rounds of sanctions, including sectoral sanctions, on Russia and its separatist cronies for their destabilization in Donetsk and Luhansk and for Russia's occupation of Crimea. Events in recent weeks have further hardened our joint resolve to support Ukraine. The sham November 2nd separatist elections and the continued flow of weapons and materiel from Russia into Ukraine are clear violations of the Minsk ceasefire. We have both, the United States and European Union, indicated that costs to Russia will rise further if the Minsk ceasefire commitments aren't respected fully. Meanwhile, as the United States and EU shore up our security in our Euro-Atlantic space, our willingness to lead extends globally. We are working with the EU and its member states to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL, militarily, politically, and economically. And we're passing legislation that makes our territories no-go areas for the fighters and finance that contribute to the terror. We are cooperating to combat climate change. We're united in combating Ebola. We are determined to strengthen core freedoms like open media, civil society, and access to information in places around the world where they are under threat. And at the same time, we continue to lead the world in development assistance and humanitarian aid. And even as we take on these security challenges, both in Europe and globally, we recognize that our security is undergirded by our prosperity. That's why we are also focusing enormous attention on our energy security and trade. That's why we are working in the US-EU Energy Council and bilaterally to support the European energy market. That's why we are encouraging EU initiatives to diversify energy sources and supplies, to boost storage capacity, to develop robust networks of interconnectors and reverse flow capacity from countries like Slovakia, and to build liquefied natural gas facilities in Central and Eastern Europe. And just as importantly, that's why we are working together to complete an ambitious Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. The TTIP will link the world's two largest and most prosperous economies even more closely. More broadly, 
TTIP will send a powerful signal that the United States and the EU are committed to an open, fair, and resilient trading relationship that creates jobs, that promotes strong environmental, labor, and consumer protections, and that fosters innovation. The economic case for TTIP is clear. We can build on and strengthen an economic relationship that already produces one trillion, a lot of zeros, one trillion dollars in trade a year that accounts for four trillion dollars in investment and that already supports 13 million jobs. Like all trade agreements, TTIP will cut tariffs, but our negotiators are looking to go further to eliminate duplicative and unnecessary regulatory barriers that hinder trade. Doing this will open up new avenues for business, and not just for the big guys. Our small and medium-sized enterprises, from the motorcycle parts maker in Boise, Idaho, to the piano maker in Brunswick, Germany, will have the most to gain from this facilitated trade. <coughs> The strategic case for TTIP is just as important. TTIP will reflect basic European and American values enshrined in our legal systems, such as the rule of law, due process, transparency, and non-discrimination, all cornerstone principles of our democracy. It will, provide, and it will provide more and better choices for all of our citizens in what we buy and what we make. And again, it will preserve and strengthen the high standards for labor, environment, and safety protections that our citizens demand at home and strengthen our hand as we promote these standards beyond our borders. We have to make the case for TTIP to our publics on main streets across our countries, not just in government buildings in capital cities. We need to be smarter and more inclusive in how we discuss the agreement. The EU's new trade commissioner, Cecilia Malmstrom, has said that she wants a fresh start in how we approach communicating TTIP's benefits. We could not agree more. We have to reinforce facts, bust myths, and speak in plain English, or French, or German, or Italian, or all of the languages of the EU about what the agreement is and what it isn't. TTIP is not a revolutionary concept. It's a natural extension of the world's greatest economic partnership, one that stretches back to the Marshall Plan, a partnership that reaches into so many aspects of our lives that many of us are not even aware how broad it really is. Every day and in every way, we pursue the US-EU partnership in ways that may not make headlines, but do make a difference. On any given day, for example, US and EU officials will talk to each other to guarantee that doctors and hospitals can use e-health records efficiently. They, reach, they can reach over half a million patients every year this way. We partner together to ensure that the millions of passengers crossing the Atlantic every year, people like you and me, can do so safely. Our low-key daily cooperation aims to ensure that professionals from accountants to computer programmers work with similar sets of rules and that new innovations like 3D printing, electric vehicles, and nanotechnology are safe and reliable. These are just a few examples of the day-to-day -day important cooperation that you won't hear about or read in the newspapers but that are so important to our relationship. Today's world knows no boundaries, and neither does the potential scope of our cooperation. That's why the United States and the European Union work together every day, and we will continue to work together into the future. Our way of life depends on it. Now, I thank you, and um, I do apologize that I have to leave a little early. I have other meetings, but I believe I have time for, for a couple of questions, if that's okay. Apologies for the cough. <laughs> Hi. There's a thank you. Hi, I'm here from Public Citizen and I have a question about investor state dispute settlement. Mm -hmm. um, so ISDS and TTIP has become quite controversial and it's actually threatening to derail the entire deal. 
in the EU, the new president of the EC, the German economy minister, and the second largest bloc in parliament have all indicated opposition to ISDS. And in the US, ISDS opponents now range from the National Conference of State Legislatures to the Cato Institute. Given that ISDS has become something of a third rail issue for TTIP, do you think negotiators should consider dropping it um, so as to move forward with the overall deal, or is TTIP not worth having without ISDS? Look, ISDS, um, the Investor State Dispute Settlement, is something that is, it's not a new concept in trade agreements. In fact, it goes back to the 1950s. European countries um, initiated the concept, and in fact, European countries have more ISDS clauses in their agreements than the United States does in, in, in our agreements, and they employ them more regularly. Moreover, European countries have ISDS clauses in their agreements with each other. We think that ISDS, uh, an ISDS clause or ISDS provisions are important for a number of reasons because they provide clear rules of the road for investors and we're seeking to promote investment through TTIP. We also think that if this is something that we, the United States or the countries of the European Union and the European Union are seeking to promote in our agreements with other parts of the world, it's only appropriately that we have it with each other. We don't think that ISDS clauses um, are, are damaging, uh, and in fact, we can negotiate and figure out how we would want it to look in this agreement, uh, but we're still waiting for the European Commission's uh, review of the ISDS clause and its uh, discussion with member states about how to proceed. I would note that when some of this um, discussion came up about ISDS within the European Union, that some of the member states of the EU went back to the Commission and said, well, you know, this is actually really important to us, and it's part of the EU's negotiating mandate. So we look forward to hearing from the Commission about their consultations on this issue and to continuing discussions with the EU about how to have the same kind of clause in an agreement between us that they have in agreements with each other and with the rest of the world. Let's take uh, one more question. Can you just tell me uh, your name and where you're from? Hi, I'm Marie Kasprick. I'm from the Atlantic Council. And I actually have a question about TPA. Um, do you think that there is a good chance that TPA will be reauthorized in the late dark session? And what do you think it might mean for TTIP as well as um, TPP? Okay. I'm not privy to what the Congress is choosing um, and what it will have time to cover in the in the late duck session. There's a lot of business on the agenda and, and not a lot of time in the session. I do know and I can confirm that of course we are speaking, the administration is speaking, the trade representative is speaking to Congress about TPA and ultimately um, we will need TPA in order to bring the agreement to Congress for approval. But there's certainly been no delay in the negotiations for TTIP, nor is it necessary for us to have TPA for either TTIP or for the negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership that are also going on at the same time. We can absolutely negotiate and, and negotiate ambitiously uh, to further our, our agreement and to reach further agreements on both TTIP and TPP without need for TPA immediately. We'll just need it when the time comes for a vote, and we're very optimistic that we will find bipartisan support, and in fact, we've already seen bipartisan support for advancing trade um, into the next Congress. So we're not we're not concerned about not having it right away. We will we will we believe have it when we need it. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, it's been really interesting, and there's a lot to take forward, especially in the new Congress. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. You. I wish you much success this afternoon. I do apologize that I have to go, but, but November is a really busy month and I have people waiting to see me back at the office. But have a lovely session and thanks for inviting me. Thank you. So we'll turn over to uh, Paul and Simon to discuss some of the political, uh, economic and energy <coughs> issues of the relationship uh, with the new Congress coming in and the new Parliament and Commission. Uh, just seating. Right so, Paul, um, can you give your thoughts from Brussels on the relationship and some of the key issues? Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I was struggling actually in preparation for today's talk to, to work out the angle of my marks and, and of 
avoid any kind of pessimistic tone. I'm, 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 I'm a kind of optimistic kind of guy normally. Uh, I have been struggling, and I think the trouble is partially because we all know uh, we're living in a kind of lamed up atmosphere, not just here, but also in Europe, we've got a lamed up Congress, a lamed up President. The EU seems to be in a permanent lamed duck uh, situation for one reason or another. Uh, and of course, with that brings the whole issues of transition, uncertainty, the lack of direction, the lack of leadership, especially on the European side, maybe. So I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate for the rest of us who wait for our political masters to get their acts together to know what's happening. I thought I used my time most usefully, given this is a very well informed audience, uh, to talk a bit about a snapshot of things that are in Brussels. I won't spend too much time because a lot of this is probably very familiar to you, but I'll try and draw a couple of threads and say a couple of things which maybe don't get said very often in these kind of discussions. Um, this has been very much, as you know, in, in, in Europe, a hiatus year. It would be, we were waiting for the new European Commission to take office only last week, but we were waiting basically the whole of this year for that to take place, who's going to be leading it, all the stuff around that, the processes involved in, in choosing a, a new president. Uh, I'm not sure whether to how to seriously to take Mr. Barroso in his last months of his last year uh, as president of the Commission after 10 years of loyal service. Where was it going to be kind of slowing down of policy output because there wasn't a point in producing too much stuff that wasn't going to be uh, pursued in the, in the new commission? But that all that wasn't terribly helpful. And then, of course, the European Parliament uh, went into campaign mode quite early on. The election only took place in May, but people sort of disappeared to campaign as much as people do campaign in European elections uh, quite early on anyway. So there was a kind of lame duck atmosphere about the European Parliament for the first half of this year. Uh, and even though they were have been elected for the past six months, only now are they kind of finding their feet that they need a commission to, 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 to spar with. Uh, in the absence of a commission, the parliament really doesn't exist. It doesn't exist really in a vacuum. So even though they, they had their house in order a bit earlier than the commission, nonetheless, they couldn't really do much. They had nobody to kind of to play with in the, in the, in the recreation park of the European, uh, European Union politics. Um, um, uh, and of course, we have now a president of the commission, and the, the first meeting took place this time last week. Uh, Juncker rather dramatically calls it a, a last chance uh, commission. We have you know, huge issues in Europe about, like we have here, maybe a trust in politicians, trust in the processes, uh, but also obviously you need to, to Europe, trust in the European project, it's called locally. So there's a lot of issues there about anything being put forward now by EU policymakers is always judged rightly so through the prism of. Is this useful to the European citizen? Uh, and maybe you should try new ways of going about business. You've got claims he wants to do things differently. We shall see. Uh, there are certain positive signs he's, he means what he says when he says that. But we, well, we, we shall see. We shall see. Um, the elections, of course, I, I was here six months ago. Paul asked me to come and talk. Uh, very nice. And it's Philip back in the room. We actually had a panel. Um, and uh, about the elections, and there, was a, there were two schools of thought six months ago, the kind of complacency, even though there's a large anti-Europe, anti-establishment bloc in the new European Parliament, don't worry, don't panic chaps, because the core group of the main parties were basically pro-European, as long as they stick together, it'll be all right. I was much more uh, concerned, and not cynical, concerned, and all that was far too complacent. And now there's a major test for that kind of solid block in, in the middle ground, if you like, of the European Parliament. Because you may have seen in the press over the past few days, there's quite a big story. It's called the hashtag is LuxLeaks. If you go on Twitter, you'll see quite a lot of stuff on the hashtag LuxLeaks um, Twitter feed. Uh, and this, it could be a major, a major crisis for uh, for the new commission before it's even basically uh, taken taken office. I don't overstate it. I won't say too much now. That might be inappropriate. Uh, the media might lose interest so after a while. And maybe some of the crisis to dislodge LuxLeaks from the front pages of the media. Uh, going forward, but it is an issue certainly at the moment and today, very topically, Mr. Yuk apparently went down to talk to the press in person, he kind of disappeared for a few days, we couldn't find him, um, but he came back, and also the European Parliament had a, what we call a mini-session in Brussels today, uh, which uh, were calls made by some of these large centrist groups for Mr. Yuk to come and talk about what, what he thinks about his 20 years as Prime Minister, 19, uh, 20 years as Finance Minister, uh, but also whether he would sanction them operate in the setting of a special special committee. So that's not a very helpful way to start because some of these groups, you know, this principle should be part of this kind of solid group behind the new European project and they're already, for physical reasons, obviously breaking off from that. Um, we have, of course, a new foreign policy chief. We call it this person, as you know, because we don't like to keep things simple in Europe, we like to make things complicated. <laughs> High representative of foreign security policy, Federico Mogherini, who's by all accounts extremely good news. Whatever you read in the press, the past few months in the, in the run-up to her being ch chosen, 
Um, dis disregard that. Apparently, she's doing a very, very good job with the ancient art. He started, but she's impressing people uh, quite uh, substantially. And it, it sounds maybe a rather arcane little point, but to us in Brussels, Brussels bubble geeks, of which I'm, I'm a member, um, it's very significant. She's moved her office back inside the office of the European Commission uh, to be more part of the her colleagues' team, much to the dismay of her, of her colleagues in the European External Action Service. We're missing the boss already, but she wants to be part of that, and she's been told by Yemka to be more, not just visibly visible inside the building of the main commission building, the value model, we call it locally, but also to be more uh, present in policy discussions outside the, the foreign policy world, but also to add, add a foreign policy dimension to other issues like trade. Who knows, she might be speaking about TTIP almost as much as uh, Cecilia Marston will be going forward, we shall see. Um, then another personnel change we don't talk about much, maybe, but we should, especially given we're hosted by the ASP, is we have a new Secretary General of NATO uh, since the 1st of October, as you know, the former Norwegian Prime Minister Ian Stoltenberg, who by all accounts also is very good news. He's going to be uh, talking to my media friends, much more media friendly. Uh, his predecessor was, wasn't anti media, but he was more cautious about speaking to the, to the, to the press. And of course, the, the arrival of Stoltenberg with his, with his charisma, with his stature as a former leading politician, his media friendly. Outlook and uh, this new lease of life on the back of all these uh, geopolitical crises we're all facing uh, means that he's going to be, in my view, quite an interesting and uh, personality on the Brussels stage, and one with which we, we hope we should all engage much more systematically than maybe we did with, uh, with Rasmussen. And of course, there are already clear signs, it doesn't get talked about, uh, Juliette talked a lot about the, the, the daily low level, low key cooperation between the US and the EU. There's all quite a lot of low key cooperation between NATO and the EU it doesn't get talked about, it's not newsworthy maybe, but what really goes to NATO, or he has been in a new job to talk to them about things like sanctions on Ukraine. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of practical work going on. When I say behind the scenes, I'm not saying kind of secretive way, there are any NGOs in the audience, but, but it just, it just, they just get on and do it because that's the way, that's the way things are, okay? Um, I won't say too much about TTIP because it's been said by Juliet. I, I broadly endorse her views. Uh, we're talking more and more, obviously, about the, what's the geoeconomics and the geopolitics of TTIP as much as we're talking about the, the, the trade aspects and the, um, the market ad, access aspects and the regulatory cooperation or the convergent aspects. I think that's quite impressive. There's a brief reference by Steve to Turkey. I think that one way to, to think about the, the concept of TTIP, is a, is a, as it's been said by the people, not me, is that TTIP is a kind of docking station to which any country can attach itself if they uh, go along with whatever's been, been agreed within the, com uh, the, the parameters of TTIP. Uh, and I think that's a message also for some of the multilateralist trade people who are often as concerned about TTIP as are some of the quote unquote anti globalization people out there. Um, but one last point, maybe, about um, the member states. I'm, I'm not going to make this into a, a, a discussion about the UK since we already have far too many Brits on, on, the, on the panel, and what we call Brexit. But there is an issue clearly about leadership, not just of institutions in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Brussels, which in many ways is less important than leadership of, of governments at the national level. And we all know by now there's this concept of reluctant hegemon, which is Germany, uh, which, you know, despite itself, quote unquote, is, is one in Europe, basically, not just from Berlin, now, but also from Brussels. A uh, lot of important and influential uh, uh, personalities now running various aspects of the EU machine are from, from Germany wasn't the case so much before. Uh, but there aren't, as you know, as you all know in this room, major issues of leadership uh, uh, of, of the European Union. Uh, I find very sort of tragic that the, as my final comment for, is that um, there's, a, there's a quite a serious and uh, statesmanlike and, and much needed debate taking place about the reformed uh, Europe. That's not kind of code for being antagonistic towards Europe or to be uh, dismissive of it or even trying to undermine it. I think it's a genuinely uh, uh, genuine and authentic uh, uh, need for debate about how to make you useful and, and relevant in the 21st century. But it's also, of course, um, uh, kind of hijacked when certain leaders, including my own back in the UK, uh, uh, perverted slightly for domestic political reasons to talk about power grabs and repatriation in one way, unilateral, whatever, power grabs back to, back to, the, back to the UK in this case. And that's, that's not helpful. So I think the uh, the, to finish off, as, as Juliette talked about, Mrs. Marstrom saying we need a new approach to TTIP and communication. Certainly, the new EU with all these institutions uh, changing uh, leadership now in the past few weeks and months 
as a major exercise in, in communicating the benefits of, of, of EU. And it's when Obama first came to the White House and it's been percolating away ever since. There's this big debate in Europe about the US not no longer taking Europe seriously. Well, I would say, and I mean it very sincerely, uh, let's look at ourselves first. And the issue, I think the major issue about Europe is that Europe is not itself taking the EU seriously, and that has to change. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And uh, Simon. We had an election here last week. <laughs> uh, some slight changes. Yeah, um, not, not slight. <laughs> what, what are your views uh, of the US approach uh, towards Europe? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, one thought about common mission and then one thought about politics. And, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, as somebody who's descended from relatives from Ukraine, Ireland, Germany, and uh, Latvia. Uh, this is a conversation that I, you know, these are issues that I follow closely personally. Um, as a great American that I, that I am. <coughs> um, so first of all, I think, you know, just in terms of strategic objective and the relationship, I, I think we have two common things that we have to work on together. First is to modernize and strengthen the liberal international order for a new day. You know, certainly the rise of the rest, these, these are all things that everyone is very aware of is presenting, uh, you know, we're, we're entering a new day uh, in history and global affairs. This liberal international order that we built together needs to be strengthened and modernized for a new, new day. Uh, that is a big project um, for the two of us um, in, in, our, in our, the EU and the US together. I think it's something that has to become more explicit, frankly, in our understanding. Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in politics that you're not on offense, and if you don't, if you aren't fighting for something, then you're losing and you're falling backwards. And I think that identifying some, some powerful areas of collaboration in the next few years would be important. Um, and uh, one of them is this liberal international order, of which TTIP and TPA and TPP become a critical piece. You know, most of the current uh, trade regimes that were negotiated in the '90s during the Clinton era, you know, happened prior to the that boom uh, and really are uh, represent a, a, an economic set of arrangements that are very foreign to where we are today. I really view not only are these Atlantic Pacific agreements the United States, but also ones that, like what happened with the ITA agreement this week, is a long needed uh, updating of these essential agreements for a different uh, economy for a new day. The second area I think we have to be more explicit about is you know, modernizing our own economies and making sure that in a more competitive world uh, where the types of skills that are required, the type of work that is needed, the type of companies that are going to be built, the type of products that are going to be manufactured and sold, um, that we are successfully making that transition. And not just parts of our the EU and parts of the US, but all of them. I, mean, I think you've seen in both cases there are laggards uh, that are dragging down or, or creating a, a difficult politics for the, the greater whole, and I think that more focus on ensuring that the prosperity that comes in the 21st century is broadly shared you know, within our political constructs, it becomes essential to the success of both the European project and frankly, um, you know, our own, our own democracy. I think this is a far bigger challenge uh, than is, I would say that I think Europe is a little bit further behind really understanding the enormity of the economic change that's coming. Um, and I think the U.S. is frankly making a far better transition to this uh, digital, you know, this modern world than, than Europe is. But certainly, this is something where, as developed economies, we share. There's a lot of shared challenges uh, for, for both of us. Finally, just on the, on the politics um, here, is that you know I think a lot will depend in the next two years. Let's just stay focused on two years for now. Um, is you know which Republican Party shows up. Um, and uh, you know the, the Republicans, the, the sort of the pessimistic view is that you know the Republicans ran the final several months of this election largely on xenophobic themes, uh, Ebola, uh, you know, stopping people from coming across the border, ISIS, uh, a combination of in some cases ISIS coming across the border, right? You know, combining some of these things, and that you know the offering that was made by the Republican Party. That these candidates ran on. I mean, this is not insignificant. I mean, when you run an election, you make an argument. You have, you can't run away from it right away. And, 
And essentially, the big thing the Republicans argued this cycle was, you know, sort of reactionary xenophobia, right? And, and at least that's how they closed with their own advertising spend in the final six to eight weeks. And if you look at the Gallup poll, by the way, about the relative health of the two political parties in the U.S., this was clearly a very successful strategy you know, for the Republicans in this election. Um, whether that party uh, shows up or a more traditional, you know, John McCain, you know, uh, or Chuck Hagel, uh, understanding of the Republican Party shows up in the next two years is a big question. You know, I mean, remember that on the Syria vote a year ago, you know, the Republicans didn't provide uh, support and cover for the president. Um, they've not engaged. You know, there was not a vote on TPA getting to the TPA question. You know, the Republicans in the House, if they wanted to put pressure or create space for the administration on TPA and TPP and TTIP, could have passed TPA through the House easily. They didn't do it because. I don't think they have the votes. I, mean, I, think they, I think Boehner would have brought it up. Um, I think he realized that the Tea Party-ish part of his party is still far more xenophobic, reactionary, inward-looking than it is outward-looking. Right? And frankly, most of the Republicans elected this cycle come far more from that style of politics than from a more traditional Chuck Hagel style Republican party. I think that if the more uh, engaged and, uh, Republican party shows up, there's um, an opportunity for enormous collaboration on all the things that I discussed earlier, um, you know, between the two parties. I think the president. One of the things that I want to close with is that I think if, if people haven't read the president's UN speech, I think it was one of the most important speeches that he's given. I think it, he made clear and explicit, not implicit, that strengthening and modernizing the liberal international order was now a arguably his major foreign policies uh, objective in the final two years of his presidency. Uh, I think that creates uh, a strategic orientation that could easily bring along a lot of Republicans where uh, of collaboration and cooperation. Um, but I do think, like in, in Europe, um, you know, one of the things that our leaders have to, I think, become very cognizant of is the suspicion of the public. I just want to build off of something that I said, is that um, you know, the, the, the suspicion of centralized leadership. I mean, if you look at the U.S. over the last, since 2006. You know, we, we wrote a paper in my organization in 2005 saying that the way the American economy was developing was going to create a period of enhanced volatility in U.S. politics because at that point we had had five years of no wage and income growth um, and that, you know, voters won't put up with that for any great length of time. And that was during the Bush recovery prior to the recession. And we predicted that if that fundamental economic wasn't addressed in a meaningful way, that we would see a period of enhanced volatility. If you look what's happened since, the party in power has been swept out of office very aggressively in the U.S. in every election except 2012. And there is, you know, somebody argued with me today that 2012, Bush still owned the economy, right? And that, in essence, the Republicans were still being repudiated in 2012. But there's been a crisis, you know, in 2006 and 2008, party in power were severely punished by, by the American voters. Uh, in 2010, 2014, this blew back on the Democrats. Um, and, and you have now this deepening suspicion of distant capitals who are seemingly incapable of articulating a vision where tomorrow will be better than today and to giving the kind of people in, in each of our respective jurisdictions you know, belief and hope that, uh, you know, that they've got a shot to make it in, in a changing world. And I think that there is a crisis in vision, uh, a crisis, I think, that uh, in both cases, political leadership are underselling the enormity of the changes that are going on in the world. I think our responses in the U.S., and I would argue that Obama, and we can get into this, has actually done a pretty good job in responding to it. I think he's done a not so good job in selling it uh, to the American public. Um, but I'm an optimist that, um, you know, as we look, I, I don't think the Republicans can do nothing in the next two years. They're in charge of Congress. If I'm correct that the party in power has been punished, it's not yet clear who the party in power will be seen to be in the 2016 American election. Right? This is a very different kind of arrangement. The Republicans are going to own more of it this time, and I think it's going to push both sides to action. In my view, it's far easier to anticipate collaboration on foreign policy than it is on any set of domestic policies over the next two years. And so I'm an optimist that we could actually make significant advances. Uh, and have a bipartisan uh, uh, 
bipartisan collaboration that will help advance the <coughs> American interests around the world, including passing and getting uh, TTIP done. Well, thank you so much. We're going to take uh, some uh, questions and answers uh, from the audience. Um, so if you raise your hand up and then tell me where you're from, uh, who you are, and then ask a quick question. So the back. Hi, I'm Thank you very much. My name is Yaya Fenusi. I'm with the United States of Africa 2017 project. You stated something about an international liberal order. Order. <laughs> can you, I'll just say that to me, can you explain the scope and substance? And if you say it's globally, I want you to know who gave you the mandate and how did you acquire the political legitimacy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's your concept. <laughs> I'll put, I'll put I'm, just, I'm just paraphrasing Bob, Bob Kagan. I mean, I'm, just, uh, I'm, I'm just ripping yeah. him off, so I, we should get him in here. But um, And you're welcome to jump in. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think a, a good example uh, yeah. of this is what, what does the US and the EU do next regarding Russia? Yeah. How, how do we... How do we face Russian aggression? How do we help Russia to step back? Um, how do we help the EU in its relations with Russia? Uh, I mean, Paul, what, what's the thoughts from Brussels on the, on the Russian? Well, as you know, well, as you know, the, 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 the kind of caveat always in, in EU foreign policy is it's all about unanimity, and have to agree, in the absence of agreement, nothing really gets decided, obviously. Having said that, clearly I think we're doing, I think we're doing quite a good job on, on the sanctions side. Uh, it's actually also uh, a kind of a, a knock-on effect of, of uh, continued discussion with uh, on sanctions. A, we, we, we Europeans talk to you guys more, but the US more about, about how to handle the strategy of sanctions. Uh, and B, uh, there's more EU-NATO collaboration also, and coordination on that, and information sharing on that. So it, it, it forces us all to work more together, if nothing else. You know, I, I think that, uh, I'll try to answer both of those at the same time, is that I think the, uh, I think this idea of a liberal international order is amorphous, it's, uh, it has institutions like the UN and the local trade system, and we go through and spend a long time doing a map of the organizations that are functional and work and those that don't, right, and, and uh, so on, but I think the basic premise is around the idea of Western values and sort of how, and I'm just saying that point blank, that and uh, liberal internationalism, <coughs> democracy, rule of law, you know, economic and political freedom, triumphing in the global arena. And I, and I think that one of the things that's going to be important for me, you know, I, I, what I want to put on the table is that I think that it is a period, you know, it's the 100th anniversary also of the founding of the New Republic, uh, the magazine, and, and the New Republic magazine has you know, was really in many ways the great architect, intellectual architect of liberalism in the United States. Uh, and what I mean by liberalism is more sort of FDR style liberalism perhaps than the way we know it today. And I think that the Democrats have to rediscover not just its progressive impulses, but its liberal impulses. Um, as we go forward, I think you know, the, it's also true of the British Labor Party and, and, and other parts of the, the developed left developed world, uh, the center left has to rediscover some of this because I think that the notion that democracy and freedom will prevail because it is here today, I think is an open question now. And I think for those of us who are wondering whether or not my children will grow up in a world as open and free as the one that I'm part of now, given that you know we know that 50% of the world is under 30 today and that this is sort of where the world is going to be. 10, 15, 20, 25 years is really an open question. It's not a predetermined thing. I think we've had a good week. I mean, I think those of us who want, you know, stability and order and prosperity and opportunity as opposed to chaos and including like, you know, alternatives that are being provided, you know, look at look what we just got done on the global stage, right? I mean, the China-US agreement on climate is a historic one. Uh, we saw tremendous progress made this week at the ITA in bringing down tariffs on digital digital products all around the world. Uh, the U.S. came out of uh, what could have been a very difficult ITU meeting, a UN ITU meeting in South Korea, feeling that the global community reaffirmed the openness 
uh, of the internet as opposed to state control. Uh, I mean, these are all things that happened in the last few days. Right? I mean, these are sort of very affirming statements about reinforcing sort of the general direction of openness and freedom versus closed and, and, and the alternative. And I think that you know, part of what I hope is that we become more bound together in this, in combating, um, you know, Tom Friedman has been calling it, in his writing, right, he's been calling it order or disorder, right? I think this is a far bigger issue um, that we have to sort of put on the table and, and mobilize together, which would be a terrific uh, joint project for us. I got this little quick anecdote that I pulled about, about Russia. When I was in dinner last week with some friends who are experts in foreign policy, and like me, so I just listened a lot and asked some questions. Uh, um, and I asked about how could we do a very big naive question, but like me, but how could we do a, a deal on gas when we're also implying imposing sanctions you know, on, on the brink of war between us? And, they, and my foreign policy defense friends, of course, inside the institution and the media, said that but it's, been, it's been agreed on both sides that we're somehow will, when it comes to gas supplies, both to Ukraine and the rest of Europe, which depend on Russian gas supplies, we do a deal, you know, despite all the other stuff, which is very antagonistic and very hostile on gas, on the commercials other gas, we agree to we agree to talk and, and find deals. That might be interesting. Yes. Uh, so I think I had uh, well, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Uh, I'm going to follow up on on gas and energy. Uh, I'm uh, Andrew Holland, ASB Senior Fellow for Energy. Um, so, uh, wanna, uh, we've heard a lot from the European side that they want a, a robust energy chapter of TTIP, uh, and energy has been a kind of a, a focus of, uh, of the U.S. on sanctions of Russia. Um, Europe has also taken a, a big lead on climate change and, and goals for 2030. Uh, so energy and climate are central to a lot of the transatlantic relationship. Uh, I guess my question comes down to uh, what does Europe want from America on energy? Uh, what can we, in TTIP and, and uh, further, uh, how can we work more with them? Uh, and, uh, and what can we do with it? We want as much free or cheap shale gas. <laughs> <laughs> You're happy to export. We have a bit of worry about green NGOs fighting us when we're trying to get it out of the ground in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, it would help if we change some laws where the people have you well, the, the land under which shale is trying to be you know, extracted and get a stake in the process you know, and the proceeds. But that's important as well. But I, 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 I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, is that? I think we are. Is it on this debate that we don't realize you're talking also sign about we don't quite understand maybe the, 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 the scale of the, some of these challenges? I don't think even the business world certainly, but maybe people around don't understand the competitive disadvantage Europe has because we haven't got these sources of, of cheap energy and now you're going to have this with breakfast, lunch, and dinner quite soon, even though you're our best friend. They went out there, it's this dog eat dog commercial world. So I think we're concerned about that. Um, you didn't make that directly about climate change, but I, I'm confused about Europe's so-called leadership role in climate change. I mean, it's, first of all, it's being, it's being uh, expropriated by, by the US now anyway. Uh, the business community, as you know, is very, should we say, ambivalent about, about climate change. They keep saying, what's the point of having leadership in climate change if nobody's following um, uh, you? Um, so I think, and I think we, even though we have these new agreements, uh, came out of the council a couple of weeks ago, uh, it seemed to be, it seemed by many cynical people, much of people whose interests are affected directly as a typical, you know, you're a fudge, but you know, everybody tries to get something out of it, but it doesn't actually have a, a clarity of purpose and objective behind it and so on. But we're very conscious that we are, we're a high cost economy, as you know, for lots of different reasons, some good, some less good, and that which energy is going to be a, it is a hugely important part. One final question for me is, uh, the, the Secretary talks about the need to re-engage with people, especially the regarding the uh, these bigger challenges. How do we do this? How do we sort of get out of the rooms in DC uh, and, and talk to people about the realities of the ground, especially in Europe, where all of the EU is against reality? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I'm, I, it is. It is. It is frustrating. And, and I, but whatever I say doesn't don't, don't assume some of you that I'm just understanding you know, conventional support of TTIP, and it's, it's wonderful. Even though aspects uh, are not so, so wonderful. 
Um, I think one issue, frankly, and it goes back to what you were saying also, Simon, is the lack of trust. People can say from Obama down to anybody else, and from all the less important position, I'm not, we're not going to you know, uh, compromise standards or whatever, but people reserve the right to say, I don't, I don't believe you, I don't trust you. In that kind of situation, no matter what you say, no matter what evidence, whatever stats, whatever passion you bring to the discussion about, trust me, believe me, we're not going to do what you think we're going to do in a negative sense. Uh, if people don't believe you, then that's, that's not very helpful. I think that is slightly, if I may say so, it's slightly provocative to some people in the audience, is kind of self-serving, because if you reserve the right always to say, we don't believe what people tell us, then you can always carry on doing what you're doing and, and, and close your ears up to a point to, to, uh, to counter arguments. But it, it, it goes both ways. I think what is not helpful, and that applies to all parties involved in TTIP, those who are <coughs> very supportive, those who are less supportive, those who are totally anti, is that there's too much kind of you know, speaking in the gallery, people, you know, there are public events which are fine, but you, you have a certain amount of time and you, and you put forward your, your case and you're not really interested in, in kind of giving uh, nuanced comments or listening to other people. Um, so I think what, one way to answer your question, finally, is that is there has been more, far more discussions, informal discussions, not secretive discussions, very transparent between various stakeholders, just to see, see to what extent a lot of this is based on genuine as opposed to other kinds of misunderstanding. Look, I, I think that you know we've done in the last decade we've done probably about a million and a half dollars of polling on people's view in the U.S. towards the economy, towards innovation, towards trade, and so on. And voters, I, I think, and I can speak for here, you know, they understand far greater. If you make fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, your understanding of globalization is perhaps uh, more acute and more accurate than <coughs> wealthy people because you know you know that you have less job stability and you know there's more global competition, but you also know that t-shirts cost $5 and they used to cost $8 and soccer balls cost 10 bucks and they used to cost 15 and computers have come down. I mean, people are very aware of the trade-offs involved. It's amazing how in our, in our focus groups and our polling, I would argue in some ways the discussion around globalization is more sophisticated than what we hear in Congress, right? I think what, what, people, what people are, which is, by the way, part of the discount, is that, I mean, I, just to conclude, is that I think that the most important thing is we have to be honest about, our leaders have to be honest about the, that this is, you know, we're facing enormous change. We're facing the rise of global competition around the world. It's not going to go away. I mean, we're going to see, you know, dozens of economies, developing economies, move up the value chain over the next generation. Um, you know, the, the you know, our companies and our workers are going to be, our kids are going to be facing a far more competitive world than the world that we're living in today. I think Europe is in extraordinary denial about that basic fact. I think we're less so, but still I think it's not a common conversation. And I think the second thing is, you know, we have to, you know, basically lay out a plan. You know, what we found in our market research is that what voters were most upset about was that it just didn't feel like Politicians really had a plan for them. You know, there was no real. They either didn't care, or um, that they were. Uh, you know, but th th they didn't care. They were didn't have the level of imagination required. That they weren't willing to do the hard work to take care of everyday people. You know, and I, and I think that to conclude is that to me the most important part is for our leaders to be far more honest about the challenges we face, the plans that we have, the trade-offs involved to engage our publics in solving this together, right, as opposed to doing it to them, we have to do it with them. Um, and, and I think that that's, because I, you know, I want to be clear about something. I mean, we've, again, we've polled and you can see declining levels of support for globalization in some polls. We didn't see that in our polling. What we found in our polling was a declining level of belief and trust that the political leadership and the economic leadership of the country we're going to do things that we're going to take care of everyday people. It wasn't that people were declining, you know, less interested in, in American engagement around the world. I mean, I would just finish by saying that, you know, one of the things that I think Sen Secretary Kerry said that I really disagree with is that I, I don't think the United States is war weary. I don't think that we're um, ready to pull back, right? I think what we want is a better sense, like any set of investors, that the policies we're pursuing have some reasonable chance of working, right? And I think that if you look in the Middle East, uh, a lot of evidence of that over the last you know, 30, 40 years, and I think that you know, our, our, our public is ready, I think, in the US for more ambitious and aggressive leadership and carving out a, a, you know, an American
American role in the world uh, that adapts itself to the modern uh, day. And, and, I, and I think that what's really lacking is not the public, it's the political leadership and the willingness to you know, bring people along on some of these tough choices that have to be made. I'm sorry, I just want to say very briefly on, on TTIP. I, I'm increasing, I have increasing sympathy in a personal capacity. Uh, when civil society groups and others talk about the need for more transparency. I think at the very beginning, the great problem about TTIP has been portrayed as a classic trade agreement. It is not a classic trade agreement. We all know it's much more than that. The thing that NGOs and other groups are concerned about is not the, the, the tariff stuff and the quotas and all that kind of stuff. It's a standards issue uh, in particular. And uh, unfortunately, so many people involved in the processes, both on both sides of the Atlantic and some of the commentators or former senior distinguished trade experts, insist on talking about TTIP as a trade deal, where a certain amount of uh, lack of transparency is justified because you're negotiating stuff with a clear financial impact. When it comes to standards and stuff and the regulation of merchants, there's, no, there's, no, there's not the same uh, justification at all, and there should be much more openness on that side of TTIP. Well, that's one of the key uh, reasons ASP was founded, uh, was to talk about these strategic issues, to be open, to engage, uh, in order to understand national security from a broad perspective. But uh, Paul and Sam, I want to thank you so much. It's been re a really interesting discussion. Looking forward to the new commission and Parliament getting work and the new Congress. Uh, if you join me with a round of applause. Sure.